Hey, Mark, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for having me on your on your program. Hopefully we can uh, share some, some good insight to your audience. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we're trying to get more into doing is bringing in experts on subjects. You know, of course, obviously it's almost always in the martial arts space. We've had some people who've talked about some other things related to movement and physicality, but you know, we're, we're here today. We're going to talk about some self-defense things. We're going to go over a bunch of stuff. And I want to let the audience know right off the bat that you're not an academic sitting on the sideline with this. You, you have a background and just as if not more importantly, you are working with people with this stuff. And at some point we will get into what you do and your business name and all those things. But I, I want, it's, it's always a fine line between we're bringing in someone who works with, knows this stuff. And this is a commercial. This is not a commercial. Um, and because we have new listeners all the time, I just want to underscore, we are never pay to play. We have never received a nickel from any guest for any reason. And it's important that I say that up front. So there we go. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. On myself, um, in my teens, I, I started in the martial arts, uh, had good success with it. Um, my Balto background, I uh, ended up having a military background, law enforcement, uh, as well as a, a crime analysis that, that came out uh, years years later. But uh, uh, it's it's been a it's been a, it's been a journey with this program. It's uh, been very rewarding how we can change people's lives literally in, in two days. Cool. And that's the most common combat we, uh, comment we get mm. uh, from our students. It, it was a life changer. I mean, it's been a life changer for me too, with the, the, the joys of watching the progression of uh, our students as they come into a class timid and, and uh, frightful and they leave with, with big smiles, even though the content that we're, we're dealing with is, is a frightening uh, mm. topic for, for people, especially those that are, are survivors of crime. And then the other reward is watching the uh, youngsters start to take this program and, and teach it. That, uh, that's also, I think, very rewarding. Is, you know, I've been doing uh, our teaching model mugging for over, over 30 years. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the improvements that we made in watching the progression is, is one of the reasons why I keep doing it. And uh, I'd like to pass it on before uh, I can no longer model uh, what it takes to, to be in the, uh, in the padded body armor that we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later, yeah. which is the kind of like the icon of uh, the symbology of what model mugging started back in the seventies. So uh, now, if you want, I can talk about that story and go ahead. You were going to. Well, b before we go there, you know, you, as human beings, we tend to find context as we relate to others. You know, you mentioned military, a bunch of the people who listen to this show have military experience. You mentioned law enforcement, a smaller percentage, but still a chunk have experience in law enforcement and corrections. But what almost everyone has is martial arts background. Now you mentioned you started, did I hear you say as a teenager? Yes, in my could, teens. Could you, could you just give us a, a little bit on why you started and why you continued? Well, I uh, enjoyed the uh, martial arts. I mean, it was a long time ago in terms of the actual reason why. I mean, the movement, the being able to challenge yourself, uh, develop your skills. Uh, and, you know, it, you know, you have the young male testosterone driven sure. uh, concepts trying to, to prove yourself. But uh, as I was going uh, through the training, um, we were looking at uh, uh, teaching a, a women's self-defense course. Mm. And that's how I, I uh, got, got involved in, in the uh, model mugging program. As I was doing some uh, uh, research and I came across model mugging back in the, you know, the late eighties and hey, that was interesting. And then, uh, you know, contact them. There's a lot of political stuff that went on, but uh, <laughs> at the, along, along the parallel lines, I was helping my ROTC program with a program in San Diego and it was the safe streets. And really what it was, was an obstacle course where they had certain stations where they pair up the, uh, uh, the young ladies and they'd go to maybe it was being a cost on the street, the car broke down and ended up in an armed robbery mm -hmm. and, uh, then they, at, the, at the end of the, the, uh, the stations, they would meet at a, a little potluck they had, and they went over some crime prevention, but they showed a model mugging clip. It was a few minutes long, and right then I realized the, that was 
one of the best ways to train. I, I never looked back. Mm. Uh, so I ended up uh, getting involved in, in model mugging and uh, it's been a, been a story in terms of uh, a progression uh, due to the political fallout and so forth that happened in the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s. But I think we've, we've come a long way in terms of how we've developed the uh, program in, in conjunction with the founder, uh, Matt Thomas. Hmm. Uh, now, th that's kind of an interesting point in that we've had people on the show who have develop things, self-defense programs, uh, other sorts of training protocols. But I don't think we've ever had someone on the show who was kind of that second generation that didn't start it, but I, I get the sense that you run it, administer it, whatever whatever word might be. Yeah, I, I direct model mugging at this okay, time. Okay, direct. Yeah. So it, it, it started as a thing before and without you and was then something that became, for lack of a better word, yours can you talk more about where it came from and what the transition to you being so uh, happy with what this is that you said i i, I want to put my energy into it yeah it started back we use uh, 1971 as the, uh, the the start year but actually in 1970 the founder matt thomas was he was studying at a karate studio he had a black belt he was one of the students uh, there uh, one of the female students, she had a black belt. She'd won trophies for tournament competitions. And she came to the black belt class and she uh, was visibly upset. She shared that she was uh, brutally raped and she felt like she disgraced her school, disgraced her style. And her mm -hmm. instructor, being that traditional martial mindset, said, hey, you need to train harder. Well, Matt's thinking, wait a minute, I've trained with this woman. She trains just as hard as everybody out here. And and uh, what he came to find out is that, uh, you know, when, when a woman's attacked, she's attacked differently than the males are attacked. So that hypothesis immediately formed in, in, his, in his head. She, uh, you know, described that she was walking and she was blitzed from behind. Uh, she was able to deliver a punch. Uh, she pulled the punch because that's how she was trained to, to, to fight and uh, was, was brutally raped. She was not taught what was going on during the, during the attack. And she, at that point, shared this and then she left the, the school visibly upset. And Matt chased after her at this point. Well, there's, well, we need to find out more about this. And he, as he did his bow to uh, exit the school, his instructor said, don't come back. Uh, so he went and talked to the gal and she uh, said, now, what are you doing? You've just made things worse. Well, here you have a woman that got mugged, raped in, in, in particular. Uh, she came to her school, technically got mugged again, psychologically. I mean, from the resistance from, from those she trained with. And then she's mugging herself because of, of everything that, that came out. But this was, a, I think, a catalyst, a, a point where uh, Matt looked at this and said, that there's something wrong with what we're doing and how we're, how we're, we're doing things. So he ended up researching thousands of crimes uh, when he was at Stanford, crimes against women, and confirmed his hypothesis that when men are attacked, it's often different than, than when women are attacked. And I like to say that he had, uh, I described it as a perfect storm of instructors at that point. He kind of did an East meets West with how he evolved the, the, the program. And uh, we can spend a lot of time on each one of these, these topics, but in uh, generalities, he put a course together uh, based on, you know, when you look at the elements of the course, Joseph Campbell's work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, because it's a journey. The actual class is a journey for people when they start and when they complete it. Um, at, he did uh, teach uh, a class when he was at Stanford finishing up, and then he transferred to Harvard uh, to go to medical school there. And they had a violent assault that occurred on that campus. And his classmate says, hey, you've done all this work. Why don't you put a class together? So he ran them through his new material, and at the end of the class, he decided, you know, I want to test my students. I want to see how well they did. So he put on what we term as primitive body armor, and he attacked each one. And they all failed. Mm -hmm. They froze in fear. They're inhibited about striking him. Uh, so what he extend, did is extend the class out to a few, uh, five more sessions. And they worked the uh, breaking that freeze reaction, uh, working at, using their skills full force. And then at the end uh, of that session, he said, you know, let's invite friends and family at, as a graduation to welcome them back as, as the final part of their journey. And during the second fight, he got knocked unconscious. 
So he realized two things. One, stuff works and I need better body armor. <laughs> uh, so uh, since, uh, since that, uh, the program really took in terms of its body armor, it took its form back in the uh, early 80s, where it started to shift into uh, what we have today. And I'll just turn the camera here for yeah. you. If, if, uh, for those that are maybe listening radio wise, it's the, uh, it's the padded assailant. It's the icon of full force fighting, adrenaline stress training, as it's called. Uh, but as I tell the initial story is that this course did come up with, hey, let's put some body armor is a good idea. I mean, Matt did a whole number of uh, analysis uh, from animal communications to uh, uh, how to teach the program, the dynamics of working with uh, different factors of our own body and, and able to, to uh, look at the first part of, of cognitive dissonance and cognitive consonance. Cognitive dissonance being from Leon Festinger's work and then Phil Zimbardo, both the psychologists uh, that worked at when you have two conflicting uh, beliefs, two conflicting emotionals or, or thought uh, dynamics, and they're in conflict. For example, we have people that are loving, caring, and hospitable people, but yet how do we become violent when we need, when, when, when we need to? To protect ourselves or our families. And so there's a disconnect there. So what we're able to do in the, in the class is merge those two with an understanding of what goes on during crime and then develop that willingness to, to defend yourselves. Um, but as the as program uh, evolved, I got involved in the uh, late 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, I already mentioned the, the fallout. So at that point, the organization uh, basically imploded. And was teaching on my own, and I came across, uh, you know, another group that was trying the padded assailant concept, uh, and realized, hey, you know what? This is going backwards in time. They're teaching women to take a combative stance to punch an, a, an attacker. Uh, the things that take a lot of time, a lot of training, and actually do the opposite of being able to avoid the violence in the first place, de-escalate it, and hopefully win without having to actually fight. Uh, so looking at it, I realized, hey, there was nothing there for model mugging in terms of a, a real organization of material. So I ended up putting the five principles of self-defense together. And this was looking about uh, the late, late 90s at that point, mid to late 90s. And I uh, gave Matt a call and I said, hey, you're, you know, he's real into the statistics and the numbers. And I asked him, you know, what are the, uh, the, uh, results of women that have to protect themselves, the feedback that we've gotten over the years. And we had a long conversation. He invited me, hey, why don't you come down to, uh, to our class? Now, prior to that, he had come to one of uh, my graduations uh, back in 92, and he gave us the compliment, hey, your students are overtrained. Um, because, uh, let me uh, go back a little bit, because so, in the early 90s, I, uh, like I said, I have the law enforcement background, went through the uh, academy, and what changed me, I started teaching model making before that, but what changed my uh, angle on, on this is that was the sections on homicide, sexual homicide in particular. It says, you know, if it's more than just the martial art, because if we're wrong, it could be deathly wrong for, for our students. And so I, I looked at what I was taught. You know, see, I learned four people separate from Matt. Matt taught somebody, taught somebody, taught somebody, ultimately taught me. And there were several people that I worked with and uh, helped in terms of working with the program and do the implosion. Uh, we separated and ended up coming back with, with uh, Matt back in the late 90s and went to his class. And that was eye-opening. You know, I'd been doing it for probably seven years and I got schooled. Hmm. And I mean, I'm not in a, in a negative way, but here I go, this guy founded it. What I went through and experienced was very diluted in terms of how he taught, what he taught, the methodologies. And uh, working with him uh, on that, I said, hey, Matt, using the way you teach the class, we can teach the whole curriculum in a weekend. Meaning we can teach uh, defense against an unarmed attacker, defense against the weapons, and defense against multiple attackers. Now, mind you, we're not teaching a lot of techniques. We're teaching basic stuff that can be used repetitively throughout these movements. Sure. So it's not just a, a, a whole bunch. You got to learn moves for this, move for this. No, the brilliance of what he developed was, was a, system, a system behind it. And, and originally when he worked with the techniques, it was to vend against armed attackers. And then he worked back to the single unarmed. Uh, for example, he went to uh, Russia and was working with the, uh, the Sambo. Uh, chief sambo instructor and, and he was showing what 
uh, he was doing. And, and one of the younger Sambo instructors says, that's boring. You're doing the same stuff over and over again. But the senior Sambo instructor says, no, that's brilliant. Because here we can train an adrenaline stress that they learn the same movements that they're able to practice when they have that startle reaction and that freeze reaction and ultimately break through it. You're back. I'm back. Okay. All right. So we had the five principles of, of self-defense and I gave that to, to our students and they were supposed to read it before they came to class. Well, when we went to weapons, you know, people read and they don't read. Oh, uh, especially oh, school environment. You know, it's just, it's just that thing. But I, I could identify who read and who didn't. Mm -hmm. And the ones who did not read the material, they, especially at weapons, they, they didn't have the intensity to lock the weapon down, to uh, engage uh, the attacker with a mindset to really win. They wanted to do it over, they made mistakes. But the women who read the material came in with a completely different mindset. They had that winner's mindset that they were able to engage the attacker, lock things, and it was almost invariably picture-perfect technique over and over again for those that read it. So I realized that while well, some of them aren't reading it, they're losing a big value of the course. So what we ended up doing is separating it back out. And now we, we cover the dynamics of sex crimes, the phases of an attack, the typologies, the criminal mindset, uh, what goes on physiologically in our own body so we're not scared of it, that we can actually welcome it in and actually channel it and use that fear as a benefit rather than a, a negative, negative force. And uh, with that uh, experimental process, we, we actually changed the, the fighting spirit. Uh, I can take uh, somebody in 20 hours and give them the psychological benefits of, of how we're teaching uh, that you can't get in a, in a martial arts school for up to maybe three years on average. And you say, well, that's really a claim. You're teaching all these fancy techniques. No, we're, we're teaching basic crime prevention, self-protection. Self uh, that they could actually um, actually get the experience of doing, but it's because they can follow through with each one of their strikes and, and get uh, channeled into what would be most powerful and most effective. But that willingness to fight back is, I think, one of the, uh, the factors that in order to, to, to actually gather, because when you're in a regular martial art, you know, you can't hurt your partner because otherwise you go in the hospital and there's no training value in that ultimately. I mean, there is for the person that put the guy in the hospital, but- Nobody wants uh, to so get hurt in class. Hurt in class. That, it's what? Nobody wants to get Nobody hurt. wants to get hurt. Exactly, exactly. So by able to put this body armor on, we're able to work, we always teach a male, female instructor team. Uh, so we, we want it, it, it's a model, model mugging. I mean, the name originally Matt came up with was, was based on uh, he called it role, uh, role model rape prevention. And it was uh, using Albert Bandura's work, uh, which is a, a psychologist. He did a lot of work with agency, with eff efficacy, uh, being on how to develop somebody's uh, abilities. And he was working with a lot of clients that had fear of snakes, fear of flying, and how do you slowly overcome those fears? Well, Matt took the concept and says, let's overcome the fear of being assaulted, uh, fear of being raped. So that's where the, the term uh, role model rape prevention came in. Well, in those early years in the 70s when he was teaching, the women would refer to the guy in the suit as the mugger. And because the mugger is an easier word to, uh, to, to say than, than using the word rape or, or those connotations. So he changed the name to role model mugging. And in 1973, got changed to, to model mugging. Uh, so for, from that, that process, uh, where were we at before? I'm going to digress. Where do you want to doesn't matter. Tangents are not only welcome, but it, but encouraged. I would like to ask you, you, you've brought it up a couple of times, the, the five, the five somethings of self-defense. Yeah, the five principles of self-defense. Are you willing uh, to share those? Well, yeah. The, the first principle is uh, crime is an emotional, physical, and uh, spiritual problem. Uh, so we're looking as you look at what does the, the criminal do? How does he do it? Why is he doing it? Uh, that will ultimately determine our options. It doesn't matter how well you can kick or punch. What matters is how well you can respond under the conditions that are imposed upon you during a, a violent attack. So once you develop those options that are 
most realistic given the conditions that you're gonna be in, now you can start to prepare them. And one of the preparations that we use is, is the using the padded assailant and, and putting the scenario-based training, the realism behind uh, the attacks where the, uh, the factor of, uh, for example, garbage mouth. And this is what the women used the term back in the uh, 70s is that the attacker, you know, we've all heard the word, the, the F word. And we've all been maybe called it at certain times, but when it's directed, especially at women, they have a tendency to lock up, even though they're the more articulate of our, of our genders, uh, they typically will freeze just with words and it doesn't have to be a bad word. It's the presence and the words that can many times just lock them up into a freeze reaction. They can't move. They, they have trouble breathing. Uh, so what we do in class is that attackers are able to uh, use that garbage mouth to where it desensitizes them to the tactics that they're using. And the words kind of go in one ear and then they go out the other. And now they can focus on more of what they can do given the situation and blend or even navigate the situation to uh, a better position for them to counterattack. And then, uh, so once you have that, that preparation that we're able to put in the body, the principle four is, you know, mind, body, spirit are one. You have to, you have to be one in yourself. And also you're looking at the attacker. If he's balanced and he's mentally focused, it's going to be a very difficult to beat anybody in, in that regard. Now it becomes a skill contest. Uh, but we're looking at a criminal event, which is not, uh, which is very different than, uh, you know, a, a cage fighting or any sparring competition where both people are ready. Uh, you're looking at different dynamics that where if you can offset his balance, now you have an advantage and then keep him off balance. And so that's the principle four is the tactical side. It's the actual fighting side. How do you take the tactics, merge it with the strategy and then operate within that environment? And then the last one is awareness. Well, the first thing is you have to be aware, but aware of what? And so this awareness is a cycle. It's actually the crime prevention cycle is one and the same. You have to look at, hey, as a criminal changes their tactics, you have to be aware of that. What are they doing? How are they doing? Why? So that you can then adjust your options and then again, go through the preparation and then practicing those. And what we do is the full four scenarios, which gives people the, the uh, immediate uh, biofeedback, if you will, because uh, as we're in the suit, now, I'm taking hits. I'm teaching them as I'm taking the hits. I'm just not a, a human punching bag walking around. So I want to look at what are they doing? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you have a, a new instructor. They're all tense. They're getting hit from, uh, all different ways, and they're very intense. They exhaust themselves. But by being in the body armor, you can develop a, a skill set to where you can be very more relaxed and conserve your energy, and then also look at, hey, how do you wear out your opponent's energy if, if you needed to do that? So that's that biofeedback that when they do a, an incorrect re, re, uh, strike, or it's not going to be very effective, and it's tactically maybe unsound. You don't respond accordingly. You don't give the, the, the feedback of a, of a normal, normal strike. And then you're also working with your coach, uh, the, your, your co-instructor. She's coaching the women. So you're working in tandem where you can be fighting full force and directing and developing their skills within the fight. Uh, and this, when you look at the adrenaline response to it, the last adrenaline experience gets uploaded to the to most, when, when your body gets scared, you immediately go to that top level, that, that most recent adrenalized experience. So as we're channeling them through it, we want them to do the techniques in a more effective way than just a flailing mauling session, which really does not have the, the best uh, value. And I've seen quite of that over the years is people take the concept of, hey, I'm going to get in the suit, but they forget there's a whole other background and, and foundation underneath that. And remember, the bottom line didn't start with the suit. That was a testing ground that actually worked and, and evolved and developed into the adrenaline stress training. Interesting. Now, I'm curious because it, your, your development of these, these five principles came from some lack, some need. I, I imagine you didn't just go home and say, uh, there's no need for this, but I'm, I'm going to invest my time and energy into putting it together anyway. There was something you saw, and I suspect that what you saw then that led to that development is something that others today also see. Maybe they would use different terms, but I, if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to share. What was it you saw that you said, this needs to be codified and simplified into these five principles? Well, it, it, was, it was a group that was, was kind of 
copying what we were we were doing and they're using just their favorite skills of martial arts skills and it was like going through a time warp when you looked at it and then i you know you have to reflect back is that well why but then you say you know we don't have a a solidified body of, of information and end up developing that and then end up following through and developing the depth behind it. It's just not, hey, I had the principles and, and I could outline those and, and went through it very quickly. But when you go back and, and revisit those different disciplines from the, you know, the medical background, the sciences, the fighting, uh, you know, what goes on physiologically in the body from the criminology, uh, that's just when things kind of open up and, and uh, confirmed what we were doing, but at the same time says, you know what, we have to be very uh, careful with our students. We don't want to give them a false sense of confidence uh, to where, oh yeah, I fought this guy in the pad of the assailant. Well, I've seen pad of the assailant situations where, you know, they post things on the media where she strikes them with a heel palm and it just falls down. Well, I tell you right now, I, I've seen a lot of fights. I've been in, in, in struggles, use of forces and so forth. It doesn't go that way. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we want to teach the develop a, a success within our students that goes with it with a mindset, uh, because you can also go the flip side of, of doing adrenaline stress training where you can create learned helplessness. And I've seen that where you put on the body arm, and you just maul the student. And that's not very effective either, because now you're developing uh, what we termed as they, nothing's working. So there, there are options or contingencies to be able to, to work with the behavior that they want to employ is not working effectively. And they say, well, what good is doing anything? This goes back to uh, Segelman's who work with the, uh, the dogs, the, the learned helplessness where he'd shock the dogs. And he did some conditioning with them, but eventually gave them an opening. And even though that opening to escape the shock was there, they had conditioned themselves that nothing's gonna work for me. I'm, I'm trapped in here and they just lie down and get, get shocked with it. And so that's a, a, a factor that we have to worry about. But on the flip side is that you don't wanna give them so much success that they realize, oh, this guy's gonna fall down. I took this class and hit this guy in the big suit, big marshmallow suit and, and knocked him out. Uh, so we, we try and leave the, the students with, with a, increase their abilities, their options, but also their awareness and their, their, their respect of, hey, there's danger out there. We have to navigate this world. We can't be afraid of it. Otherwise, what's really the point of living? So we, I think we do a pretty good balancing of that. Um, and and it's, we don't want to develop the, the attitude that, hey, this is my world. I can take it on. For example, I said one, one story was where, uh, you know, a woman, she wanted to use the ATM. It was, it was at night. And she realized this guy was there. Well, I have the right to use the ATM. Okay, yeah, you have the right to use the ATM. But she went up there and all of a sudden, this guy starts harassing him. And she turns around the keys and the knuckles and says, you know, and gave him a, a verbal barrage of things. And I'm thinking, well, that's dangerous as heck. In fact, I actually had a case like that where a woman, uh, she fled a situation. She, her other friend went with her. She's in the alley. And this guy just walking down the alley approached him. And she went verbally off on him. Well, this guy, Allison, pulled out a gun and told her friend, says, she better apologize to me right now. So there's, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be a, an understanding that, you know, I, I mentioned we want to win without having to fight. We want to be able to teach them to, one, they can recognize the dangers. I mean, the first principle uh, of what we do is what does a criminal do? How does he do it? Why is he doing it? Uh, from that understanding, you can then uh, identify when you're in a serious situation, Hey, I don't want to be here. There's something wrong here. When they recognize that, they can get the safety sooner. Uh, for example, one of, uh, one of our students, she was uh, going to do some work in a, a prison. And she went through the class and she had the, the dynamics of, of what we teach. And she went in there and she's dealing with these inmates. A lot of them were sex offenders. And she, she almost started to laugh, not literally out loud, but she's laughing because she's thinking about in class and thinking, this is what these guys actually do. And they and it was just the recognition of it that brought her a peace of mind that says, you know what, I'm not gonna be lured by these guys because I recognize the tactics that they're employing. And when you can recognize going back to the fifth principle of awareness, all right, being aware of what? Well, that little bell is gonna go on in, in their head and, and hopefully that will keep them at a, at a much better recognition of safety. Mm. You're, you're throwing so much stuff out and it's hard for me to pick like where where I want to go, but let's, let's kind of follow the, the timeline, the storyline here. At some point you became director. 
which suggests a couple things. One, uh, the, the founder's name is Matt, right? Matt Thomas, yes. Okay. So Matt saw enough in you. He liked you. I, I assume it wasn't some um, corporate takeover. You know, this this, this was no this wasn't some some oh, backroom deal against his we, will. No, uh, we've, we've developed a uh, a good relationship over the years. We, we were training, like I said, we, we were merging. Uh, I, I had that that break from him for about six or seven years, and mm-hmm. and really he got pretty beat up over this. He got stabbed in the back. I mean, in all mm-hmm. its uh, purposes there. So he's a little leery of getting involved with people. So time had healed a little bit when I reached out back to him. And, and so we started working uh, uh, together. He liked what we were doing in terms of the evolution of taking what he had started. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I would have been able to do what I did without having that, that fundamental origin, that beginning balance that he, uh, he established. Uh, but we, uh, working uh, within this is about uh, I think 96 97 uh, time period and uh, then 9 11 happened he went back in the service and I didn't go until later I did two tours overseas uh, but then I just started running running with the program at that point and we've always stayed in contact uh, I pretty much uh, run it he's a lot older he was uh, what 1920 uh, 21 when he was working with uh, with this content and developing the program so relatively young brilliant on it, a brilliant tactician. Uh, uh, his story is uh, an amazing story as well, in terms of what he, he went through as a youngster and then ultimately developed and how he thought and and what uh, was the ca- and that developed the catalyst in, in his approach and his instructors at Stanford and and so I, I have to give credit to I'm piggybacked off of him, uh, but it was that piggyback all, all that the best allowed, stuff does. You know, yeah, it's what all the best stuff I, does. Don't don't reinvent the wheel if you can help it, right? No, no, I, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There's no point. When I was a youngster wanting to get involved in the program, I, I saw how beneficial it was, but I, I didn't recognize there's a lot of depth here. And working with Matt again, it developed a depth in him and took it took it farther. I mean, we've gone back and forth, and so I always consult with him. It's it's a, out of respect. Uh, he is he did found it. He's like I said, he is a brilliant tactician. And we go back and forth on some, some stuff and we've changed things and said, Hey, Matt, you got to look at, this is why this technique needs to be adjusted because of what's going on on the, on the criminal side. And, and we look at it, we go back and we, we consider, we, we're just not looking, Hey, this is the, the technique. We, we're looking two responses beyond the technique because when somebody's going to attack somebody, they're in this position. And if you're going to respond to it, well, they're going to do something in, in better. You know, the military, I'm sure you've heard it, said, hey, the enemy gets a vote. And that's, that's a common, common theme is that just because you do something doesn't mean they're just going to let you do it. So they're going to be a response. And then that's how we, we've adjusted our, our, our material. And how can we give students in a, just a short period of time something that they can take away? Now, those that that want to do more. I mean, there's a whole plethora of different martial arts styles they can join and we welcome that. In fact, when we get instructors that want to teach, I prefer they have martial arts background and I don't care which one it is because it, it's a blending. It's a blending of ideas. It's, it's a blending of a common goal of, of basically using the skills that we've learned to master ourselves to then help others master themselves. So it's a, again, falling in line with the, with the journey of Joseph Campbell's work, the hero with a thousand faces is that, and it also works with working with survivors is that you have to acknowledge that, hey, horrible things happen in life and sometimes it's happened to us and you step into that abyss. And when you step into the abyss, you have to let go. And in order to get to the other side, you have to actually reach out to faith. And when you do that, that faith will reach out, grab your hand and she will take you to the other side. Now in doing so, she has one requirement and that is that you share the way. So if you look at all the heroes of time. They always get help doing it. They never do it alone, but they have that requirement. They come back and they show other people how they can find uh, healing through those tough times in life. And so the class itself models that. And that's why many of our survivors find it's so rewarding. They, they can actually change the endings. Uh, so the, the, the material that we've, we've come up with in terms of how we've structured it, the, uh, in terms of the organization of the class, um, is actually is, is a healing process in, in many respects. When we did some of the scenario training, when you actually do the, the actual sexual assault scenarios, um, a lot of women would break down and cry on the mats because the triggering is all coming back. Right now, we get very few women that actually cry on the mat. 
meaning that they, they, because through the educational process, we're able to dissipate a lot of that acuteness of the past, of the, of the actual trauma. And we've been doing this for about 15 plus years and then came across uh, Phil Zimbardo's uh, work, the famous psychologist through the prison study and, and so But he was working with uh, Richard Sword and, and uh, uh, Mary, Mary uh, Sword and she, they were working with a lot of, a lot of trauma survivors, whether from an accident, whether it was from a sexual assault, whether it's from another type of crime, uh, it could be from war. They were working all different types of, of trauma, but they found when you could dissect the dynamics of that trauma as in a way of understanding it, you could actually spread the acuteness. I call it spreading the acuteness out. So it's not as focal point and allows you to function more freely. So what we've done is, is find that uh, ability in class that we have survivors go through the class and they're able to change that ending as they, they rework it. If they want to uh, revisit their actual scenario, we can role play that, but most of them, most of them don't, they don't need to. Uh, but their ferocity in which they fight and how they respond is, is, is wonderful to watch. Now, the flip side of what we do when we teach the class with the educational uh, dynamic is that we can take somebody who's fortunate enough not to have that horrible experience. Uh, and so that, especially for maybe some of the younger women, uh, so they, under, they start looking at, this is what goes on during these attacks. This, is, this, this isn't going to happen to me. And they start to develop a willingness to fight something to fight for, something to fight against. And to watch their willingness to fight back is also wonderful as well. So we can take the, the two parallels and move them through that actual journey of the class. And again, when we come at the, at the end of it, I don't want to build up that false sense of confidence. That's something that's always uh, plagued me. It's always said, is it gonna be, are they gonna be able to perform as well? Because like I mentioned before, we're going way back to when I started is is this realistic enough for them to survive a violent encounter with a, with a criminal that's in a, in a rage? And we, we give the women options. They, just because they took the class, we emphasize, you don't have to use anything. The most important thing is that you survive the assault. That's most important. And there's four general options that we, we give them. You know, they could acquiesce, they can uh, surrender. And many people have survived violent assaults by acquiescing to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody could criticize them. I mean, think about it. You're not them. You're not dealing with that person at that moment in time. So who are you to, to give judgment on what they did to survive given what they know? Uh, the other options, they can maybe uh, try and negotiate, try and verbalize a way to maneuver a situation, maybe to get out of it or to make it less, less of a situation. And women have, some women have found success with that uh, and some men as well, but that, that may not work. Uh, the other option is that, hey, you fight back to escape. Okay, well, that's a good idea, but not all your situations would allow you to get to an escape. Can you hurt him a little bit and run away? And I did my, my study on, on the benefits uh, or the, the, the statistics on running away and the effectiveness, but you may be in that situation, you can't. So what we take in the class is we try and look at, okay, what's worst case scenario? Now we don't work the whole class on worst case scenario because otherwise it'd be the what if to the world, but uh, we're able to, uh, to get them to respond in a way that they will finish the attack. If you've hurt him enough to where he's dazed, we're not gonna give him that second chance to recover and hurt you especially if he's bigger, faster, and stronger, or you're in an isolated spot, and you can't get to safety, because if you run too soon, he may chase you, and you got a bigger problem if he catches you. So that's uh, when you look at the four general options that we give our students, uh, that's, that's where we, we base the, the curriculum from, and it's up to them to make the choice, and that's all, all we can do. I mean, I can't cover all the variants uh, the, the research that I've, I've done in terms of when you look at uh, how predators, what they do to people during the crimes and, and from this position, that position, um, it just, it just can, otherwise the class would be going on. And that's not the, the point. The point is to give them something that they can function effectively, more effectively in life. And, and that's the feedback we get from our graduates is that, Hey, this course literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. wow. One of the, relevant subjects that come up in any kind of self-defense discussion at a higher level has to do with legal ramifications. Is that something that you step into? I would imagine it's something you're aware of oh, yeah. given your background. Oh yeah, I've looked at uh, hundreds of federal cases 
And looking at the uh, affirmative defense uh, side of, of defending yourself in, in court, per se. And so we, we've developed the, you know, the, the justice skills. And what we, we, we want to do is we want to balance many of the justifications on our side versus the arguments on the other. And so when we look at that, when you've taken the time to look at what goes on during a crime, and it's not just simple one, two, three, you look, at, especially for sex crimes, that's the most complicated of all types of crimes. That's, there's so many different dynamics that are involved in that. So once the idea is to get as many of those things on the other side of that scale that can be arguable. And once we can argue those things, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be hands down from, from a jury standpoint, because uh, ultimately that's what we look at. So we teach them, hey, you know, it's, uh, one of some of the jokes are, hey, man, one or two strikes is enough and then run away. Yeah, okay, it'll be gone over what, if, what happens if he chases you and now you've got a bigger problem. But, and then if you do three, four, five, six, it's manslaughter. Well, you got to look at what are the, what are the dynamics. If, if you and I got in a situation and we're probably comparable height, weight, uh, at a certain point, you get the best of me, you have to stop. Otherwise, it becomes that manslaughter. But if you take somebody who's smaller, uh, you take a woman defending against a criminal uh, who's probably going to be bigger, uh, faster, stronger, and has maybe more experience in, in committing crimes. And also, you don't know where he's going with the assault, right? How often is it publicized? Uh, the media loves these stories, right? This person was killed over that, and that person was, was captured, tortured, and you know the list goes on and on. So that part of it's very easy. You don't know what their intent is. So if you have to kick them into a point where they're not moving anymore, now you've allowed yourself to have time, time to get to safety. And then we have them report the crime because that reporting the crime also absolves them of a lot of accusations that they're just running around beating people up. Uh, so they have to make that recording. And then you probably heard the, uh, or maybe possibly seen it, you know, our, our, and the fight is call 911. And it's to reinforce the fact that you need to report the crime uh, because that does absolve you of a lot of the liability accusations that uh, a prosecutor may, may take against you. And there's, there's many more. I mean, we, we could spend a section on, on just this, this topic alone, sure. but that's yeah. really uh, how, why we, we would justify that, hey, you have one opportunity. And if you don't, you now have an educated, angry, attacker out at you. Now, what do you think the ramifications are at that point? You've given them a second chance to harm you and you've lost your ability to escape uh, uh, maybe permanently at that point. So uh, that's, the, that's the reason. And you get some of those comments on, on you know, that, that you're going overboard on it, but you're not in that situation dealing with them and they have to make the choice. You know, for example, 80% of the time, a woman's going to know their attacker. Does she knock him unconscious? Well, that's a choice she has to make, but we don't have the full dynamics. Is it just a, a, a spat between a, a couple spat where they're initially dating or is she being stalked because she's trying to get away from this guy? So here we, you know, the spectrum is significantly very, very wide on, on what you can, what you can do, but, and they have, they have to make that choice. And we do have a segment on, on class, the legalities of, of using force. And what justifies us to teach him to, or teach them to win by knockout. Sure. And they have, to, they have to pick that. I can't pick them, pick it for it. And they have, they have to walk away understanding that uh, that particular, uh, that, that, that is a secondary threat. But at the same time, you, I know your, your listeners have probably said, you know, it's better to be, you know, uh, you know, a judge by 12 or whatever the jury box is going to yeah. hold and carry by six. Right. And that's, that's the premise we, we take, at least, at least in this country, uh, while we still have some type of judicial, <laughs> Maybe let's, let's be careful let's be careful let's not, let's not go there we're, we're you and i are probably on the same page but i i want to make sure people don't miss the stuff that you're saying uh, so one of the things that i think is is important for us to maybe unpack at some point this program before you was longer than a weekend it sounded like no, it's it's been pretty much uh, the okay, the hours. Uh, you're talking about we, we five a, something. Well, it can be divided up. Oh, okay. I, I, tra I travel a lot, so I, okay. I teach in a week. I got to be in and out. A local team, if I if I am local, they can uh, they can teach uh, spread it out. Okay. four or five hours over a number of number of weeks here. That all right? Got it. Um, 
given that the majority of people paying attention to what you and I are talking to today are in fact martial artists and quite a few of them are martial arts instructors. You and I talked a little bit before we started recording that, you know, we've, we've got some likely some, some shared thoughts on where I'm not going to necessarily mo say most, but at least many martial artists who are teaching self-defense um, are missing some things. You've got an opportunity to give some advice to these folks, if you're willing. What would you tell them? Well, there's no point in recreating the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm willing to share what we've, we've taught or what we've learned and, and how we're progressing and look forward to how we can actually improve the program and make it more effective for the students we train. Um, there's no point in, in keeping it all bottled up and, and trying to hoard it in there. It's, it's, a, it's a way of sharing it. And there's the other thing is, is you got to consider safety. Uh, safety in what we do on, on a number of playing fields. It's, uh, there's the physical safety. That's why people ask me, hey, you want the suit and so forth. Well, you need to be trained in the suit. Um, you can be injured in it, um, but so you have to look at the physical safety of the person wearing the equipment. And that corresponds with this. We want to teach with a, a coach, a qualified coach who, who can recognize certain uh, factors that can also help direct uh, how the fighting goes. Because it's, it's the whole, whole part. I've, in the body, and I fought somebody six, six, 300 over 350 pounds, and he wasn't fat. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's given it everything he got. Fight was done and went back and, and got into went to the next student. So the, the equipment does work, but there's certain ways that I move and able to absorb the blunt force energy. Uh, so it's not as impactful for my body. I've had a brain scan and it's, it's come out uh, normal, but maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I keep, I keep getting in the suit, right. But, but that's part of the, 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 the factors that you watch your student progress, because even though I'm getting hit and it looks like I'm losing, but every time my student wins, I've won. And, and that's the, the dynamic that I've always taken, even from the very beginning, is, is how can you help the person that you're going against? Uh, it hasn't affected my martial arts skills. I can be able to put the body armor on and response in some respects has probably helped me kind of more of an Ironman uh, principle because you're sweating out an enormous amount of liquids and you're going from student to student and you have to respond, especially when you're fighting men in the body armor, you have to be on because that power ratio is typically two to six times greater. Uh, not to say that women don't hit hard. There's some really heavy hitters uh, on, for, for women as well, but it's that safety factor, that physical factor there, but you also got to be able to move in a way you keep your students safe. Uh, how we move in class um, may not be particularly realistic in, in some respects, but I try and give them, hey, these are some of the different looks you may get as you deliver a good, solid, qualified blow, uh, because you're going to get a response from the attacker, good, bad, or indifference. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you don't respond as well. But you got to keep that student safe so that and our safety record is really wonderful. When you look at the most common injury you get is a broken fingernail. And they're going as hard as they can. Uh, but we also take other safety precautions. If a, if a woman has a, a some type of injury, we will adjust the fights accordingly because they all came into class. We want them to all leave class. The so point as we mentioned earlier is not to, not to get hurt. Nobody wants to get hurt. Uh, being able to adjust their situation, being able to teach somebody in a wheelchair while at the same time you're teaching the rest of the class who's, who's functional. So there's that safety factor that has to go both ways physically, but then there's also the emotional uh, safety factor, not only to protect the, the students' uh, emotional where they're at, uh, when, when you have dealing with survivors of crime, you have to be very attentive to that and understand where they're coming from, and then how do you move them through their journey? And it's their journey. They have to be willing to make the journey. Otherwise, you know, they'll, they'll get benefit from it, but it won't be as powerful as if they, they can do that. Uh, and then also uh, emotional for you as the wearer. When, when, I teach uh, what I call thugology, you know, the study of the thug. How, how does he act? How does he behave? Because it's just not a matter of getting in the suit and, and being that character. It's, it's how do you portray the character realistic to give a representation to your student uh, so that they can come away that their bodies, when they leave class and are attacked, they physiologically know no difference from the class 
to the real situation. Uh, for example, you know, we, we brought up garbage mouth. We had uh, you know, students that have been accosted or been threatened by an individual and the words were going in one and out the other, but they said in their mind, they're thinking, is this all you got? Because it's lost its effectiveness. I heard worse in class. Uh, and so as we get towards the end of class, the garbage mouth is, is it really goes away. But from a psychological standpoint, and, and that's usually the cases where we have good men that want to help people, they say, hey, I don't know if I can do that. Well, there's different dynamics that we take uh, that we can adjust to to get rid of that that cognitive dissonance of being able to portray a portray the actions and characteristics of, a, of an attacker, of a, of a criminal minded individual. So you can better help your, you know, your students. So it's, it's that dynamic of being able to uh, protect everybody in the class the best we can. And, and we're dealing in the abyss. You know, the, the initiative said that if you look hard enough into the abyss, the abyss looks back into you. And we are dealing with that and, and it does. And, and how do you keep that balance in life? And, and how do you have developed that resilience, resiliency for the, this type of work and this type of topic? Uh, from the martial arts standpoint, it's, it's difficult to do. If you don't have all the barriers, we're able to hide behind the mask, uh, behind the, the helmet there when we're training the characteristics. And, and we develop certain things that we can separate ourselves out, but we'll also give that representation to, to our students. And, and, uh, in a very effective way that they leave the class better prepared to recognize danger and then ultimately get away from it. And worst case, if they have to use the skills. Um, they probably go on with different, different other types of topics. I mean, the skills that we, we teach are, are not a lot of variety of skills where you have to really think about it. In fact, I tell the students being in class, I don't want you to remember. I don't want you to remember what we taught you in class. And they kind of look at you and go, well, what do you mean? Why am I even here? Because if you have to think about what was your going in class, you're too late. You're, you're, you're too slow. You're behind the time. You have to blend with that situation. And uh, just what, what I do is I, I like to call it a mud board, a, a basic shape, a basic understanding of the dynamics of these types of crimes. And then you help your student, once they can recognize the shape, they can actually pick out the typologies. You have survivors, the way we, we portray the information, in other words, that was the typology that attacked me or they understand the phases of the, of the assault and are able to recognize when's the best time to, to, to strike back. Because uh, you're going against somebody who's bigger, faster, and stronger, depends on, on again, that, that, that principle, mind, body, body, spirit are one, and be able to recognize and, and maybe maneuver a, a tactical situation to where you put them at a separation point where they become more vulnerable to attack. So it's a lot more than just, hey, I'm just gonna hit the guy, the, the marshmallow suit, uh, Darth Vader running around in a, in the equipment. And it's, it's a lot more than that. So uh, we're here to, to help people out. And that's what I've done for uh, over 30 years and will continue to do it until I don't, can't physically uh, model the, uh, the attacker anymore. It's just, but I can still mentor the, the, young, the youngsters coming up. Of course. This has been awesome. There's been a lot of great information. And I suspect that there are, there are people who want to go deeper. So how would they do that? I assume there's a website. They, they yeah, you go to modelmugging.org. Easy. Uh, you can shoot, get, get on our contact list, shoot me an email, and uh, I'll be happy to talk and share how we can help help you help other people if that's what somebody wants to do. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. It's, you know, what you're doing needs to be done. And, and, you know, I'm sure we're both aware. You're not the only one doing it. And you're not the only one doing it well. But, um, you know, to the listeners, we, we had a recommendation from someone who's been through this program who also has been on the show as a guest and maybe multiple times, I'm trying to remember. Uh, and so that those recommendations carry some weight. And my hope for everyone is that you're, you're letting what we've talked about today get wheels turning. Because if wheels are turning, you're seeking answers much in the same way that you did early on, Mark, much in the, in the way that Matt did early on. There, there's, there's stuff missing here. Let's find some solutions. And I think that's the most important part. Yeah, I agree with you. All right. Thanks for being here and uh, stick around. We'll, we'll chat a little bit more. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on, on your show. Thank you.